From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Spencer Tracy and Fay Ray in the Sinclair Lewis drama, Aerosmith. <laughs> Lux presents Hollywood. Our sponsors wish to thank you for your splendid support of our products, in appreciation of which they bring you these Monday night productions. Headlining our program tonight are Spencer Tracy of Metro Golden Mayor Studios and Fay Ray. As guests, John R. Kissinger of Huntington, Indiana, the United States Army private who risked his life that a cure for yellow fever might be found, and Terry Hunt, the man who keeps the screen stars physically fit. Lewis Silvers conducts our orchestra. And now, here's our producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I like Sin Sinclair Lewis' description of himself. I'm just a country hick, he says, living on a farm. And every time I leave it, I get into trouble. A non-conforming literary thunderbolt for many years, Mr. Lewis won the Pulitzer Prize for Aerosmith, but turned down the $1,000 as a protest against what he called the restrictive terms of the award. The son of a, phys of a physician, with a grandfather, uncle, and brother, also doctors, it's easy to understand why Mr. Lewis turned to medicine for the background of his story. Before writing Aerosmith, he spent many months in a New York medical center doing research. There he met the famous biographer of medicine, Dr. Paul de Cruyff, and with him traveled through the West Indies on a tireless search for color and material. Tonight's presentation is based on the magnificent screenplay and stars Spencer Tracy in the title role. Mr. Tracy commands an unquestioned position as one of the finest actors ever seen in motion pictures. For his appearance here, we thank Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, who next present him opposite Joan Crawford in Mannequin. I'm also delighted to present, in the part of Leora, a girl with one of the most enviable records of hit performances in Hollywood. Beautiful, talented, unspoiled, Miss Fay Ray. Helen Wood is heard as Joyce, Frank Riker as Dr. Gottlieb, and John Qualen of the original cast as Novak. And now the curtain vanishes, and the Lux Radio Theater brings you Arrowsmith, starring Spencer Tracy and Fay Ray. <laughs> the Zenith Hospital, somewhere in the Middle West. At the end of a long corridor, a student nurse is on her hands and knees, vigorously scrubbing the floor. From the elevator comes a young doctor, just out of medical school. He steps along briskly, pardonably impressed with his brand new degree. As he passes the nurse, she splashes water onto the floor and into the cuff of his trousers. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you look where you're slapping that water? You got me soaking wet. Well, I didn't mean to. Never mind now. I want to find Ward D. Can you direct me? I could, yes. Well, if it isn't interrupting your work. This isn't my work. Nurses aren't supposed to scrub floors. The superintendent caught me smoking a cigarette. You go back for Ward D, turn right, and then left. I've been informed that the first duty of a nurse is to stand when a doctor speaks to her. Oh, gee, I've been getting fresh again. Oh, I didn't know you were a doctor. It may interest you to know that I'm assistant to Dr. Gottlieb at the university. And then I'm on my way to Ward D to take a strain of a very dangerous microbe. And after I've done what I came to do, I'm going to report you. Look out for the pails. Oh. Oh. You, you shouldn't go around kicking over pails. Now you are wet. What's your name, please? What's yours? Aerosmith. Uh, say, you know, you're not reporting me. Oh, gee, there I go again. Well, scrubbing floors just makes me rebellious. And being rebellious naturally makes me fresh, and there you are. I'm sorry, really. My name's Leora Tozer. It's a silly name, isn't it? What's wrong with it? I kind of like it. Oh, do you? Well, thanks. Uh, uh, when can you get away for dinner? With you? I've decided to overlook reporting you. How about tonight? Well, I... Why not? I, I don't mind. What time? Miss Tozer. She's at the head nurse. You will telephone me the patient's temperature every hour. And I'll look in again at 7. At 7. You understand that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Doctor, at uh, seven. 
We got the same results every time. The injected rats lived and the others died. That's what gives you the check, see? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. You're really interested in research, aren't you? Oh, it's the only branch of medicine. You get to feel that when you work with Gottlieb. Prevention of disease. Tracking down the microbe and finding out what'll wipe it out. It's worth 10 pounds of cure. Yes. I wish I understood more about it. <laughs> I guess I was a little too technical before. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I liked it. You made me feel intelligent. Well, uh, at that, I guess you've got to get used to hearing my ideas. Am I going to hear lots of them? You're going to marry me. Well, you don't tell me. Oh, yes, I do. Well, now, you know, I, I shouldn't wonder if you're right. Of course, it's pretty early in the game to be dead sure, but I shouldn't wonder. I guess you're pretty self-centered and pig-headed, but I like you so much I'd be a fool to pass you up, wouldn't I? I wasn't being funny. I didn't think you were. I meant what I said. I hope you did, because I wasn't being funny either. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Gottlieb. Oh, come in, Martin. Come in. Well, sir, I have sent for you, Martin, to tell you that I am leaving this place where I teach young doctors how to kill their patients. You're leaving? Yes. I have been called to the McGurk Institute in New York, where I shall do only my own research. The McGurk Institute is the greatest scientific plant in the world. I'm very happy. I should think you would be, sir. I'm very happy for you, too, Martin. I have arranged to take you with me as my assistant. Oh. Ah, you will have opportunity there. Well? Dr. Gottlieb, you're the greatest man I've ever known. I'd black your shoes for you, uh, but I can't go to New York with you. Why, Martin, why can't you come with me? I'm going to get married. Oh. And a, a man can't marry on what a lab assistant makes. I, I've got to go into practice after all. Practice? <laughs> practice. Give pills to ladies and hold their hands for them. You, you who have the stuff in you that makes scientists... Well, that's how it is, sir. Oh, well. Who is she? Leora Tozer. She, she comes from a little town in Dakota. We're going back there. It's not much of a place, but uh, I'll be the only doctor for 30 miles around. Well, I, I know better than to argue with a man in love. You'll be a very bad doctor for a while. And then you will find your way back to the laboratory. Now, let me know when you do, and wherever I am, I'll have a place for you. Thank you. No, so, so, no, no. Good, good luck to you, Martin, and I wish you happiness. Martin, Martin, come in here. What is it, honey? Look what I found in the attic. Paul's old Prince Albert coat. Hey, you don't expect me to be married in that, do you? I certainly do. And you can wear it when you make your calls. Oh, but Lee, darling, I'm a country doctor. Of course you're a country doctor. But you're the biggest man around here. You've got to listen to folks' troubles and help them out. You gotta mend their bones and settle their domestic problems and pull their teeth all in one day. You gotta see that the milk's pure and the meat's fresh and the backyards are kept tidy. That's what being a country doctor means, Martin. Oh, <laughs> Dr. Aerosmith, I'll be so proud to be your wife. 366 human souls in this town, all depending on me to keep them fit. <laughs> oh, Lee, sweet, I didn't know a man could be so happy. <laughs> The doctor isn't in. Oh. Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. Good night. Is that you, Martin? Oh, Martin, you're drenched. Come in. Here, let me take your coat. It's all right. How's the little Weller girl? Is she better? She died an hour ago. Oh, Martin. Gottlieb was right, I guess. I am a rotten doctor. You mustn't say that, Martin. You did your best. You did everything you knew. Oh, but I didn't know enough. That was it. It's happened before. It'll happen again. Please, darling. Don't talk like that. I should have operated tonight. Any other man would have operated, but I didn't. I waited too long. They won't blame you for it? No, that's the trouble. They don't blame me. They just sit and stare at me and wonder why their baby should die with me there. Why their baby should die in my arms. 
I'm not God. I can't work miracles. Martin, listen to me. You've done well here, darling. You mustn't let one case discourage you. Try to remember the others, the people you've helped, because they remember, and they love you, Martin. I'm, I'm not discouraged, Lee. I, I guess I've just stagnated, that's all. I've been doing the same thing day in and day out for three years, stitching cuts and setting bones and prescribing for croups and colds. It's got me, that's all. Martin, it's my fault, isn't it? What are you talking about? I never should have asked you to come here. I should have let you go on with your research. That's what you wanted, oh, wasn't darling, it? don't be silly. I've tied you down. Come here, come here. You're all I want, Lee, darling. You're all I want. Regardless of anything else. I'll get it. Oh, hello, Novak. Come on in. Thanks. I want to speak to you, Doc, if you've got a few minutes. Sure. Evening, Mrs. Aerosmith. How are you, Mr. Novak? How's your wife been these days? Uh, her? Oh, she's fine. The doc fixed her up good. What's on your mind, Novak? Well, it's my cows, doc. Your cows? Yeah, they're sick. Last two, three weeks, I lose 12 cows. All my cattle sick. Well, look, Novak, I'm not a vet. I, I know, but uh, you smart fella, doc. But I don't know anything about cattle. Well, what are you doing for them now? Well, the state uh, vegetarian, he come. He, he give them what he calls serum, but he's no good. The poor cows, they used to die quicker. What does he say it is? He call it black leg fever. But it don't do no good to call it by a name. All I know is pretty soon it's time to settle some cattle to pay mortgage on my house. And pretty soon I got no cattle left to sell. That's why I come to you, Doc. But, Novak, I... Please, Doc, you come. Please, hmm? All right. I'll be over at your place in the morning. Oh, thanks, Doc. You help them all right. You fix them. I know that. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mr. Novak. Cattle. Well, that's a new one, isn't it? Still, it might be something I could... What did he say it was? Black leg fever, I think. Black leg fever. I wonder if they've isolated the germ. Martin. Don't you think it's time you went to bed? Hmm? Huh? You've been working with this serum stuff all day. Hmm. Research, honey. Turn off that boiling water, will you? Your research has made an awful mess out of my kitchen. It's my laboratory now. Gottlieb used to say that any man who really wants to find out things can make a lab out of toothpicks and a piece of string. <laughs> I use pots and pans. <laughs> it's Mrs. Bull just phoned. She says her back is worse again. Ah, tell her to go out and hoe potatoes. Martin. I'm busy. But, Martin, you can't throw over your practice for a lot of cows. It isn't the cows, Lee, sweet. It's the fun. Now, you go back to bed, darling, please. I I'll be pretty busy. I was right. I was right, Lee. Look at this. Yes, Martin. That vet serum wasn't any good. Yes, Martin. We'll try mine in the morning. Yes. I'll take it over to Henry Novak's and shoot it into half his cattle. Yes, Martin. If they live and the other half dies, we'll know we've got something. Yes, Martin. <laughs> What's the matter? Are you tired? Yes, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Lee. Well, that's five days, Novak. Not a new case yet. <laughs> Not a one, Doc. <laughs> By golly, Doc, I think you better be state vet around here. I'm sorry about the ones that died, Novak. Yeah, well, you should ought to have shot your stuff into them, too. No, 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 that's where you're wrong. You see, the ones we gave the serum to are all right. The ones we didn't give it to aren't. But you have to try both ways when you're experimenting. That's how you find out which way is best. Yeah. Well, I ain't kicking, Doc. How much I owe you? Oh, not a cent. Forget it. It was just for fun. <laughs> Pretty good fun for me, all right. Hey, look, it's the state vet. He heard about your stuff, Doc. Where is he? Where is he? Hi, Doc. I got a couple of live cows over here that might interest you. Nothing you got would interest me. And I want to tell you, young fella, I'm state vet. And I don't like no youngster like you telling me my business. So keep clear of these cows or you'll land yourself in a pack of trouble. Oh, I see. I didn't know it was like that. I was only trying to help. You, you let Doc Law and he's all sure right. Sure he is. Here you're getting to be quite the vet, Doc. Yeah, best in town. <laughs> I'll be back on the stomach aches now, though. Yeah. That's where you belong. How's that? I say the stomach aches is where you belong. 
Now, I hate to say anything, Doc, but you've got a tone in your voice that I don't like. It's about time you understand. Suppose you that... try to understand that I made a blackleg serum that's better than yours because mine cures blackleg and yours doesn't. If you think you can discredit me and then hold me up... I'm not holding you up. I'm giving you this. Well, this is what I'll give you. My fist, see? Listen. I'm a scientist. When I see a scientist's job I can do, I do it. That's what science is. Now, if you don't want any blackleg serum from me, don't take it from me. Take it from the government. I've sent my reports and samples back to Washington already. You dirty... No, 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 you knocked him forward, Doc. Yeah, sure. That's science, too. I've found my line now, and I'm raring to go. You can find me at my house, Doc, anytime you've got any more differences to settle. Quick, Martin, open it up. I'm so excited. You've never had a letter from New York before. It's from the McGurk Institute. Listen. We have been watching your work on blackleg fever. May we offer our congratulations. Dr. Gottlieb has recommended you for a position in our experimental laboratory. Good old Gottlieb. May we hear from you soon. Yours truly, Dr. A.D. Witt Tubbs, director. What do you think of that? Martin, you're, you're going to accept it? Why, of course we're going to accept it. But it, it means giving up everything. Just on a chance. Oh, but Lee, darling, it's the chance we've been waiting for. We've got to take it. Of course, if you want to. I... I'm going to love New York, darling. And so we conclude Act One of Aerosmith. Before Spencer Tracy and Fay Ray go on with Act Two, we go backstage in Hollywood for a moment to a projection room at one of our famous studios where a director, his secretary, and an agent are watching a screen. Yeah, she has a beautiful voice, Joe, but I can't very well put that girl in the middle of a chorus scene. Why not? What's the matter with her? Well, look at the close-ups. Look at her skin. But the girl can sing. Joe, I haven't time. I'm late now. Come around sometime and I'll talk it over with you. I'll be on set three, Miss Sherman. Well, of all the silly now, things... Now, Joe, I... take it easy. It's too bad, but... Well, I should think a girl like her would have known about Lux Toilet Soap. She looks as if she has cosmetic skin. And that's a very smart crack. No, Joe, I mean it. Seriously. She has those little blemishes and things. It comes from not getting makeup off thoroughly. The pores get all choked up and the skin gets so coarse-looking. Say, I didn't come here to get a lecture on skin culture. Well, you're getting one. You'd better tell some of your talented new singers about Lux Toilet Soap. That's what the movie stars use to guard against cosmetic skin. Hey, listen, that girl can sing, and no director can tell me Remember, otherwise. Remember, Joe, the chief himself complained about her complexion. Why, what good is a voice? Well, in... maybe you're right. You're an agent for a lot of other Hollywood women. Ask them. They'll tell you that they use Lux Tartar soap regularly, and that its active lather is what keeps their skin so swell. Well, I'll remember that. And so will the women, I hope. Back to Mr. DeMille and our play. Spencer Tracy and Fay Ray continue in Arrowsmith. With a keen anticipation of glory still to come, Arrowsmith turns eagerly to his first love, the research laboratory. In the impressive corridors of the famous McGurk Institute, he walks slowly along with his old friend, Dr. Gottlieb. The old man's arm is about his shoulders, and he smiles delightedly at the young scientist. So, Martin, you found your way back to me, huh? Just as I said you would. That's right, Dr. Gottlieb. And you have come on your own feet, too. That was a good piece of work you did with those cows of yours. You have earned your position here. Ah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad. Very glad. Well, good morning. Good morning. Dr. Arrowsmith, I presume. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Arrowsmith, this is Dr. Tubbs, our director. Oh, oh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Allow me to welcome you, doctor. It's always a pleasure no, to... No, 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 not now, please, Dr. Tubbs. For the moment you leave my prodigal son to me, huh? I want to show him his laboratory. Oh, well, of course. Good day, Arrowsmith. Good day, Dr. Tubbs. Here, come in, Martin. Well... This is your laboratory. Say. You like it, huh? Like it? <laughs> this will be better than giving pills, eh, Martin? Dr. Gottlieb, do you really think I know enough to work here? 
I mean, I, I want to succeed, but... Succeed? Succeed? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know that word. It is a word little schoolboys use. <laughs> now, let us be clear, Martin. You will do your own work here and have nobody but yourself to satisfy. You will learn to work twice as hard as you can, and then when you get stuck... Well, I, I have a fine collection of detective stories in my office. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, come in, Terry. Tubbs is looking for Dr. Gottlieb. Oh, he's mad at me again, eh? <laughs> Arrowsmith, this is Terry Wicket. He is a roughneck, but a good scientist. you <laughs> like him. How are you, Arrowsmith? How are you? <laughs> well, see you later, Martin. And now I go and smooth the feathers of our ruffled director. You brand new, Arrowsmith? That's right. Well... What do you think of dear old McGurk? Well, frankly, I'm very impressed. Yeah, I was too. This place was built to impress people. <laughs> Wait till they start giving receptions for society. You love it. <laughs> you don't, evidently. I'm a scientist, not a teacup juggler. But I got my lab and a chance to work by myself. I can put up with almost anything if I got that. So can I. You'll be all right, then. Keep plugging, that's all. And uh, don't let Tubbs poke his nose in too much. Well, let me know if I can help you, will you? Sure, thanks. See you around. God, please give me clear eyes and freedom from haste. God, give me anger against all pretense. God, keep me looking for my own mistakes. God, keep me at it till my results are proven. <laughs> Martin? Martin, what are you doing? Hmm? Oh, nothing much. I was just thinking. Are you ready for dinner yet? Hmm? Are you ready for dinner? Martin, what's the matter with you? For weeks you've done nothing but sit around and, and stare at things. It just scares me to death to see you this way. You won't be scared much longer, Lee. What do you mean? I've made up my mind to chuck it before they fire me. I've been at McGurk two years and I haven't accomplished a thing. I'm worse at science than I was at doctoring. You mustn't say such things, Martin. It's going to be all right. I know it is. Why, for all you know, you may be plumb on the threshold of a great discovery this very minute. I got a kind of feeling that you are. Don't look at me like that. I have. And you'll feel much better after you've eaten your dinner. I bought a wonderful fish this <laughs> afternoon. I'm not hungry, Lee. Neither am I. I. I guess I'll go out for a walk. I'll come along. In this snow? Oh, I love snow. We'll hike across the park. It'll be like the Canadian Northwest tonight, Martin. Martin! Lee, sweet, I, I forgot you were here. I, I was a little behind you. You were walking kind of fast. But I guessed you'd be coming here to the lab building. And you tagged along all this way, you poor <laughs> kid. I'll call a taxi to take you oh, home. Oh, no, I don't want a taxi, Martin. Let me come upstairs with you. I may be late. I don't care. I won't bother you. I promise you not to open my mouth. Oh, please don't send me home. It's such a scary night. I'll imagine things. What things? Oh, things. All right. Come along. Martin. Martin, I, uh, I don't want to interrupt, but... What is it? Uh, I thought maybe I could help. Oh, oh, sure, sure. Uh, there's a flask in the incubator, the one on your right. Bring it over, will you? A flask? Uh, I don't see... Oh, I've got it. Is this it, Martin? Let me see. No, honey, the flask on the right I want. Well, this one was on the right. What? Why, it couldn't have been. Yes, it was. There's only two of them there. This one was standing up on the right side Let of the... Let me see that. Well, that's funny. What's the matter? Get out of the way. Uh, here, wait wait a minute. Get me a clean microscope slide. They're in the top drawer. A microscope slide? Here. Now, get out of the light. Stand over there. No, darling, over there. What is it, Martin? Martin. Why, it's impossible. It can't be right. It can't be. What is it? I, I, I don't know. I, I left this flash chuck full of some germs I was working on. They ought to have been doing great. Now they're dead. What killed them? Well, does it matter? Does it matter? I'll say it matters. Germs don't commit suicide. Something killed them. 
Something got into that flask and blew those bugs to pieces. Now, now, what was it? What was it? But, Martin, suppose it did kill them. Don't you understand, darling? If it killed one type of germ, it may kill others. It may kill them all. It may even kill... No. No, I won't throw away my luck. I'll work it out. Tomorrow, darling. No, tonight and tomorrow night and the night after that. I've got to find out what killed those bugs. Martin, what do you mean by getting up so early? I, I gotta get back to work. Gut leaves checking my results this morning. I think we've got something, honey, something big. We're calling this stuff bacteriophage. Did I tell you? You haven't been to sleep for a week. Just look well, at you. Well, what's the matter with me? I shaved. I won't have any more of this. Do you hear me? I'm not gonna stick around here and watch you kill yourself. I'll walk out on you. I mean it. Come here. Come here. You mustn't ever say that, no matter how mad you get, Lee. I love you. I know I'm neglecting you, but when this is over, I'll take time off every day, and we'll go to the movies, and we'll have friends in, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you flowers every morning. I'll even learn to play bridge. Stand by me, Lee. Oh, darling. Got any coffee? Sit down. And there's the paper if you want it. That's the girl. You certainly have a sneaky little way of getting around me, Martin Aerosmith. As if I wanted flowers every morning. All I want is to make you take care of yourself. You're a rotten husband. Do you know that? Martin. Did you see this? What? This thing in the paper. Listen to it. Greatest medical discovery of modern times. Young scientist wipes out disease with bacteriophage. Director Tubbs of McGurk Institute interviewed by press. Why, that's wonderful. Wonderful? Look, there's your name. He's giving you full credit. He's made a fake out of me. That's what he's done. By that cheap publicity hound, he can't do this to me. Martin, where are you going? I'm going to see Tubbs. Wait, I'm going with you. Please, gentlemen, please. Let me through here. Get, get out of my way. Martin, wait. Ah, good morning, Aerosmith. Aerosmith, hey, how about steak? I've got nothing to say. I want to speak to you, Dr. Tubbs. Of course, of course. Excuse us, gentlemen. Come in here, Aerosmith. Martin, please. Yeah, come on. Martin. Well, and how are you, Mrs. Aerosmith? Come to share your husband's glory? There's no glory to share. Are you responsible for this stuff in the papers? Of course, my boy. I don't deny the responsibility. I claim it. A slight overstatement to catch the public's eye. A slight eye. overstatement? You tell the papers I can wipe out all disease when you know I haven't even cured whooping cough yet and you call that a slight overstatement? I understand your surprise, my dear fellow. My surprise? I'm only surprised I don't twist your fat neck. Martin, my husband's a very violent man, Dr. Tubbs. I, I... I know your husband, Mrs. Arrowsmith, and I mean the world to appreciate him as I do. After all, he's still got his name to make. You made that for me. You made my name smell from one end of this country to the other as a quack and a faker and a racketeer. Now you call those reporters in and you tell them I'm through with you and your front page science and then I've resigned from your cheap Jack Institute. I'd so much rather tell them about the paper I've just signed. That makes you the head of your own department and raises your salary from 5000 a year to twelve. Oh, I, I won't take it. I'm through. I don't accept your resignation, Martin. I pin my faith on you. I do more than that. Martin. Martin, my boy. Now, what is it, Dr. Gottlieb? Can't you see we are busy at the moment? Yes, busy turning my friend Martin into a megaphone. Don't worry, Dr. Gottlieb. Something has happened, and something perhaps not altogether bad. Martin is not the discoverer we thought he was. What? You don't mean someone has stolen a march on us? Here it is, in the medical journal. The Frenchman Derelle of the Pasteur Institute in Paris has just published his report. It is the same thing, Dr. Tubbs. You got into the newspapers too soon. I'm sorry, Mark. The, the same thing. Mm, this is most unfortunate. Most. Of course, there could be no talk of a new department now and no raise in salary either. Hmm. If you'll excuse me, I'll speak to those reporters. Yeah, how about, how about some good paper here? You may not be the discoverer of bacteriophage, Martin but you may still be the man to test it out. Come and see me later in my laboratory. Then we will discuss what further work you still will have to do. I love that man, Gottlieb. He might have gloated. Poor Martin. All I've done these months has been wasted, Lee. You won't get your new flat or any of those things now. It's tough luck being married to a scientist, isn't it? I haven't minded. Well, it's over now. 
Well, I had a lot of fun out of it, anyhow. Believe me, gentlemen, what I say is true. There is bubonic plague in the West Indies. Bubonic plague? Well, you should know, Dr. Sandelius. Yeah, I do know. Already I have spoken to Dr. Tubbs about it. He is anxious for the Institute to send a representative there. He would be if there's any publicity in it. Now, please, Terry. Just one moment. What do you think, Harold Smith? Well, it might be a good chance to test out the bacteriophage. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Your bacteriophage, Harold Smith... It isn't mine, Dr. Sundalius. The discovery belongs to Darrell. No, no, no. I say it again. Your bacteriophage may save the islands. That is why you must go there, to the West Indies. But I don't know anything about bubonic plague. But I know. I teach you. Get me plague germs. Get me rats. Get me rat fleas. Yeah, fleas. Little yumpy fleas. And I show you what I have learned in China and in India. Yeah, I show you. <laughs> then I go with you. <laughs> So, you are off tomorrow. All packed and ready, Dr. Gottlieb. Taking your wife along, Martin? Oh, no, of course not. She'd like to go, but that's out. Good. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, sit down. I have called you in here to give you your final instructions, Martin. Yes, sir. Can you be trusted, Martin, to perform a little experiment where you are going? Can you be trusted not to let anything, even your good, kind heart, spoil it? What is the experiment? Uh, you agree that it will be of value in future epidemics to know what this stuff of yours is worth? Oh, yes, of course. Now, if you could give your injections only to half your patients and sternly deprive the other half of them, then you would know. I certainly would, but... That is the experiment we mean. Oh, Martin. I couldn't do that, Dr. Gottlieb. Why couldn't you? Sit by and watch half my patients die. It wouldn't be human. So you're just a country doctor after country all. Country doctor, nothing, but I've got some pity in me. They'll be dying down there. They'll be dying and begging me for help. Sure they will. <laughs> so many men are kind and neighborly. And so few men ever add to human knowledge. You have the chance now, Martin. But, but Gottlieb... I'm an old man, Martin. I've been an honest scientist all my days. But I count on you to carry on my torch after me. Are you going to fail me? Are you, Martin? No. I won't fail. I'll do my best, Scott Lee. All ashore, the going ashore. Your stateroom's this way, Dr. Aerosmith. Thank you. <laughs> Leora, what are you doing? I wasn't going to come. I tried hard. Honestly, I did, Martin. But I couldn't let you go without seeing you off. I can't let you go now. I'm going with you, Martin. Oh, darling, talk sense. How can you? I'm just going. Darling, there's disease down there. Bubonic plague. You're going. And where you can go, I can go. I belong with you, darling. I can't let you go alone. I'll never see you again. I know it. Oh, Martin, please. Please take me with you. Leora. Martin. Oh, Leora. You crazy little fool. Oh, oh Martin, I, I'm simply going to love the West Indies. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. weekly custom of giving you little inside glimpses of Hollywood between the acts of our play finds us host tonight to a favorite physical director of the stars, Terry Hunt. Now presiding over the gymnasium at United Artists Studio, Terry for 12 years has been keeping the stars in glowing condition. His subjects have included Marlena Dietrich, Mary Pickford, Clark Gable, Jeanette MacDonald, Norma Shearer, and Paul Muni. Gary Cooper and Frederick March take orders from him daily. People are always interested in superlatives, Terry. So from your observation, 
Who physically is the most perfect among the women stars? That's a little too tough to answer, Mr. DeMille. But I can name certain stars who, in my opinion, have at least one feature which you could call perfect. Just put them all together and you've got something. You mean a composite picture? Made up of what? From whom? Well, I'd say this mythical girl would have the carriage of Norma Shearer, the face of Virginia Bruce or Joan Bennett, the eyes of Claudette Colbert, and the shoulders of Faye Ray. She'd have the figure of Ginger Rogers, the neckline of Merle Oberon, and the torso of Jean Parker or Carol Lombard. She'd also have the legs of Marlena Dietrich and the hands of Dorothy L'Amour. Now, the odd part about all this is that most of the beautiful features I've mentioned can be developed. A woman who pays attention to her diet, who exercises regularly, gets enough rest, and who otherwise takes care of her appearance can be just as attractive as the women on the screen. And what's your particular prescription for exercising? Based on my work with the stars, I have found that posture and reducing exercises bring the best results for women. I prefer the twisting, rolling, and stretching routines, and, provided the subject has a strong heart, jumping rope. For years, I've advocated extreme cleanliness of the skin, and a most helpful and enjoyable way of obtaining it is to take a shower with plenty of soap, not just a hot or a cold shower, but both. I've used many soaps to find the best, and I'm glad to say that Lux Toilet Soap is not only my choice, but that of the stars as well. The kind of shower I've suggested with a heavy, rich lather of Lux soap will not only thoroughly clean your skin, but will aid in preventing you from getting stiff. Now, Frederick March tells me that every morning before reporting to the set of the Buccaneer, you come to his home and put him through his setting-up exercises. My thanks for keeping him as fit as Lafitte, the pirate whose part he plays. Mr. March is a perfect contradiction to the reports you sometimes hear that Hollywood stars live a life of ease and indolence. When making a picture, he's up every morning at 6 o'clock and goes through at least 45 minutes of real training before breakfast. I wish everyone could get a look at the stars in a gymnasium. You'd all realize how seriously they really work to keep physically fit. And now if you think I can be of any help in telling you more about health through exercises, I'll be glad to answer your questions as best I can and without charge. If you'll address me, Terry Hunt at United Artists Studios, Hollywood, Just send a stamped, self-addressed envelope. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. (laughs) Back to the story of Aerosmith, starring Spencer Tracy and Fay Ray. The town of Blackwater, in the West Indian tropics, in a tiny bamboo hut on the edge of the town, Leora waits alone for Aerosmith to return. From outside is heard the dismal wailing of the natives, praying vainly for release from the plague. Suddenly, the door is flung open, and Arrowsmith enters. Well, Martin? Well? It's a bust. The authorities won't let me try my experiment. They say it's inhuman. What are you going to do? I'm clearing out, Lee. Get my stuff packed, will you? But where are you going? There's a tiny island about 20 miles across the bay, the island of Carib. It's all native and plague raging like wildfire. I'll have a free hand there. Come on, hurry up, will you, darling? Martin. What? You're not planning to leave me behind. Lee, sweet, I've got to. I didn't come here to be left behind, Martin. You're not afraid? Certainly I'm afraid. I'm scared blue. But that isn't the point. I came down here to look after you. I'll be all right. How do I know that? It might get you, and if it did, nobody but I could nurse you. And even if it didn't get you, I'd go mad not being with you. Oh, don't you see, I... I haven't any life outside of you. I've got to be with you, always. Be reasonable, Lee, darling. I, I don't know where we'll be living or what we'll get into. I, I can't take you along out there. It's no place for a woman. Now, if I'd known you were going to behave like this, I'd have choked you before I let you come. <laughs> you did everything else but choke me. Oh, all right. Darn being a woman. That's the girl. Give me the comfort of knowing that you're all right. Now, come on, pack this stuff, will you? Yes, Mark. This is only the first of our big hikes, Lee. If I can pull this stunt off, I'll be a big man in science. Then we'll go to Europe, Lee. To your France and Italy and all those places. Well, you see, our life's just beginning, Lee. Oh, Martin. I do love you, darling. <laughs> Two lines there. Keep them in two lines, Sunday, Liz. Two lines. Two lines. 
Ah, what a place this is, Martin. They don't even understand what I'm talking about. We've got to make them understand. We'll inject the phage in the line on the right. You keep swabbing their arms and passing them up to me. The line on the left does without the injection. Poor beggar. Now, there's no time for sentiment. Come on. Number one. One. Two. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Two. Three. Three. Four. Stay in line. Stay in line. One hundred and ten. One hundred and eleven. Easy, easy. One hundred and ten, Sandelius. One hundred and eleven. Keep them coming, man. One hundred and twelve. One hundred and... Oh. How do you do? I didn't know there was a white woman on the island. I'm Joyce Lanyon. Oh, yes? You might have seen Mr. Twyford's house on the hill up there. I'm visiting with his daughter. You don't belong here, then? <laughs> Hardly. I'm from New York. Well, do I get your injection or don't I? I'll get on the other line, if you like. Stay where you are. Thank you. I wish you'd find something I could do to help you. You? I know what you're doing here, this experiment. I think it's marvelous. Well, perhaps you wouldn't if you were on the other line. That's not very fair. I volunteered to do that. I'm sorry. Then let me help. Do I strike you as so hopelessly useless? I think if I had a twin sister, she'd be just like you. That's how you strike me. That's an original compliment. It's no compliment. It's a scientific fact. Now move along, please, and give science a chance to carry on. All right, Sandelius, pass them up. Sandelius! Yeah. Yeah, Martin. What's the matter? I... I don't know. I think maybe I'm sick, Martin. Good God. Yeah. Now maybe I take some of your injection, too. Catch him. Ca catch him there. Sandelius. Sandelius! I think it was his whole life. He used to troop all over the country lecturing on the heroes of health. Poor Sandelius. He's one of them himself now. You... You took it pretty calmly. If one of your field officers dies in battle, you can't stop to mourn for him. You've got to carry on. And you did. Wonderfully. All these long days. All by yourself. I had you to help me. I... We better go in now. No, no, not yet, Joyce. I'm too excited to turn in yet. Don't you see my life had its first great climax today? The experiment. All our troubles are over now. I, uh, I know that's a very unscientific boast. Just for tonight, though, I, I can't help believing it. And I can't help believing that anything ever happened before this plague. Or that anything will ever happen after it. Steady, Joyce. Don't lose your nerve. You're too gallant for that. How wrong you are. There's nothing gallant about me. I was never meant for this sort of thing. I've never learned about realities. But the way you stood by me in the face of danger, disease. That wasn't gallantry. That was just hysteria. Hysteria over falling in love with you, Martin. What? I have fallen terribly, insanely in love with you. But you don't mean that. I don't believe in mincing words. I don't believe in not saying what's on my mind. I, I know there's nothing to be done about it. I'm not a child. But I... I was unhappy when I came here. I'm not unhappy anymore. That's something, isn't it? I've never learned about women like you. You belong to the great class of things I've had to give up for my work. You make my life seem suddenly rather empty, but very exciting. You're too heroic to mean that. You're stone. I wish I were. Do you? You're finished here now, aren't you? You'll be leaving soon. I, I should, of course, but it might be a good idea to stick around for a while. It, uh, I mean, see how the experiment turns out. How long would that take, Martin? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, ten days, perhaps. Ten days. I'm glad, Martin. I, I think... Hello? Yes, yes, this is Karib. Clifford speaking. Who? I can't hear you. Who? Oh, just a moment, please. Arrowsmith? Dr. Arrowsmith? Just a moment, please. What's that? 
the matter, Twyford? I can't make out. It's Blackwater calling you. Blackwater? Give me the phone. What is this, Mollison? Hello? Hello? Who, who is this? Leora? Well, what's the matter, darling? What? Leora, I, I can't hear you. You'll, you'll have to speak louder. What is... Leora, Leora, listen to me. Listen, darling. He hello, darling. I... Leora, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, God. What is it? My, my wife. She's sick. But... I've got to get to her. She's alone, all alone, and she's sick. Is, is there a launch here? I can take you. How soon? Right away. Come on, then. Hurry. Hello? Hello? I'm trying to call Karib again. Can't you... Call it for me. Hello. Operator. They... They must answer. They must. Oh, please. Please. Oh, Martin. Martin. Why don't you come to me? I try not to cry. But I'm afraid, Martin. I don't want to die alone. You will come. I know you will. Oh, but hurry. Please hurry, Martin. Help me. Help me. Oh, Martin. Where are you? Where? Lee, Leora. Oh, God. Leora. Leora, look at me. Leora. Is she... Is she all right? She... She's dead. Oh. Well... Hadn't we better pick her up? Yes. I'll help you. No. No, I'd rather do it alone. You see? She hardly weighs anything. Oh, Lee, darling, I loved you. You knew that, didn't you? You knew I couldn't have loved anyone else, didn't you know that, Lee? But now you're gone. This thing I've been fighting has killed you, too. But it won't kill anymore, Lee, darling. I promise you that. It won't kill anymore. I'll shoot them all full of serum, all of them. I can save them all. I can save everyone. Everyone except you, my darling. Oh, Lee. Institute. One moment, please. Yes. When are we going to see Dr. Arrowsmith? Dr. Arrowsmith has just returned and he's too busy to see anybody today. We've got to have some sort of a statement. Really, we must see Dr. Arrowsmith. Hello, Martin. Oh, hello, Terry. Thought I'd find you in the lab. We heard about your wife. Sorry, fellow. Thanks, Terry. Well, how'd they go down there? Pretty bad. I bungled it, Terry. I was afraid you had. Dubbs doesn't seem to think so. Well, he wouldn't know. I lost my head, gave everybody the serum. I wonder what Gottlieb will say. Nothing. He gave me everything I knew. He gave me my chance and I failed him. Whatever I accomplished down there, I failed him. I didn't add to knowledge. I did the humane thing. I lost sight of science. I hope he throws me out. He won't, Martin. He'll never know you failed him. What do you mean? He cracked up, went to pieces. Too much work, I guess. He doesn't understand anything now. Gottlieb. Then he's gone, too. There's not much left, is there? There's still research, Martin. There's work still to be done. Ah, here you are, Martin. The reporters are waiting to see you. 
Are they? Is there anything wrong? I just told him about Gottlieb. Oh, yes. Very unfortunate. Hmm. But we've a man to take his place, thank heaven. You, Arrowsmith. Does that surprise you? <laughs> well, from now on, you're a department head with a salary of 15000 a year. I guess that'll buck you up. I guess it won't. You can take it if you want, Arrowsmith. But I came in here to tell you what I was going to do. I'm going to clear out of this swell joint with all its swell equipment and publicity and build my own lab in the Vermont woods and really get something done for a change. Your own lab? Sure. What do you say? Is it a go? Martin. Joyce. You didn't expect to see me here, did you? Do you think I'd have missed welcoming you home? Thanks, but... Oh, I know how it is, Martin. I heard everything. But I... I helped you once. I thought perhaps I could help you again. Your sweet choice. Thank you. Well, I guess this lets me out. Wait. Joyce, I'm sorry I can't accept your offer. No, yours either, Tubbs. You can keep your department head. You can keep your glory. And you can see those reporters yourself. Tell them I'm not what they think I am. See, I'm a bust, a failure, a washout. But I'm not licked yet. I'll do something for science if it kills me, but I can't do it here. Gottlieb said a man could build a lab from a bottle and a piece of string, and that's what I'm going to do. Come on, Terry. I'm going with you. Lee and I, we're both going with you. Do not let yourselves be tainted by skepticism. Live in the serene peace of laboratories. Say to yourselves first, what have I done for my instruction? What have I done for my country? Until the time comes when you may have the immense happiness of thinking that you have contributed in some way to the progress and good of humanity. With these words of Louis Pasteur, we ring down the curtain on Arrowsmith. As a fitting afterpiece to our drama, and before Spencer Tracy and Fay Ray return, let us look into a scene that happened in real life, a scene that serves to introduce our next guest. The year is 1900. The place, the town of Quemados in Cuba, infested with a deadly plague that's killed more American soldiers than fell in the Spanish-American War. Two men stand in a room facing Dr. Walter Reed. They are Private John R. Kissinger of Ohio and John J. Moran, a civilian clerk, who've come to answer Dr. Reed's call for volunteers. Reed has told them of the horrors they'll face, that their chance of coming out alive is one in five. He's also told them their only reward would amount to about $300. Private Kissinger answers him. The one condition, sir, on which we volunteer is that we get no compensation for it. Dr. Reed looks at them in silence. Slowly, his hand goes to his cap. He has only four words to say. Gentlemen, I salute you. This was the scene that marked the real beginning of Dr. Reed's work in showing how the dread plague of fever can be banished from humanity. Tonight, the unsung hero who helped make that possible is with us. I am proud to present the former private, John R. Kissinger. Like the Dr. Arrowsmith of our play, Walter Reed was faced with a terrible truth that any successful experiment would have to be made on human beings. Why couldn't he have used animals, Mr. Kissinger? Because all animals are immune to yellow fever. They discovered this about the same time that Dr. Fenley brought out the theory that yellow fever was carried by mosquitoes, yellow jack. Yes, up until then it was thought that the yellow fever was contagious, that you'd catch it merely through contact with its victims. And the only way Dr. Reed could prove that this was false, was to take the mosquito, let them bite normal, normal human beings, and watch the result. And just what happened to you, Mr. Kissingham? Well, Dr. Reed associate came into my room with five mosquitoes, specially selected. Two of them had bitten men who had recently died. 
They applied them to me, and I was bitten three times. Five days later, I had yellow fever. And it was the result of that experiment on you that convinced Dr. Reed he was on the right track at last? I guess that's right. Others went through the same experiment later on. Some died and some lived. But Dr. Reed proved to the world that yellow fever was caused by a certain type of mosquito. And that type of mosquito is now being driven from the earth to destroy yellow fever forever. But tell me truthfully, just before those mosquitoes laden with yellow death bit you, weren't you tempted to change your mind about being a volunteer? I had seen my comrades die from it, Mr. DeMille, and I knew exactly what I was in for. My thoughts then are my thoughts now that a man is lucky to be able to die for the cause of humanity. Thank you. I salute you, Mr. Kessler. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Spencer, Tracy, and Fay Ray. My thanks to you, Mr. DeMille, and to the sponsors of this program for their wonderful complexion care, Lux Toilet Soap. Like most actresses, I've used it constantly for many years because, in my opinion, there's nothing better for keeping the skin smooth and fresh and clear. And, Spencer, I want to tell you what a pleasure it was playing opposite you tonight. You know, it would seem that you're the favorite doctor of the Lux Radio Theater. Each time you've been here, you've played an M.D. Well, there is no profession I respect more, Faye, and none that has more real drama. You know, what a lot of us seem to overlook is the fact that the work made famous by men like Pasteur and Reed, by William Harvey and Jenner and Perret, still goes on in laboratories all over the world. Look what's happened in the last few years. Pernicious anemia has been beaten by two young doctors who found a wonderful remedy in liver. And out of the dirt and filth of sores, mind you, has been found a bacteriophage that has revolutionized the treatment of staphylococcus infections. And at this moment, in quiet corners, men are bent over their microscopes in a struggle that may go on for years, but undoubtedly will someday see the ends of colds and of cancer and infantile paralysis. In a world where so much is measured by power and wealth, where destruction is still practiced and tolerated, what a source of comfort it is to know that some great minds still think great thoughts, how to help humanity. Yes. The world stands still without medicine without unselfishness. Not all of us can be Aerosmith, but we can and should make our little sacrifices for the common good. Which leads me to an announcement our sponsors join me in making for the annual mobilization of human needs. This is a national drive for the support of hundreds of welfare organizations throughout our country. Funds are necessary to care for the needy, and only through your individual contributions can the money be raised to continue the good work. So we ask that you give your support and remember that your contribution may mean new life to a man, to a woman, or to a helpless child. Be a good neighbor and send your donation to your local community chest. I'm sure our entire audience will do their utmost, Mr. DeMille. And now, good night. Good night, CB. Good night, Faye. Good night, Faye. <laughs> Melodrama comes to our microphone next Monday night. In the story of a girl and the three men she loved, one is her father, a famous criminal lawyer, one is her fiancé, and the third, a man outside the pale of society. It's a play that ran with great success on Broadway and the screen, A Free Soul. As the girl brought up to do whatever she thinks is right, regardless of public opinion, we bring you Ginger Rogers. And starring with her... Donna Michi and Charles Winninger. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ginger Rogers, Charles Winninger, and Donna Michi in A Free Soul. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.